Okay, so give me some more. Mm. Okay, I see people coming in. So I think we'll uh, start and I would like to welcome everybody who has just uh, connected with us um, and it is with great pleasure to welcome you to the fifth uh, to the first lecture of the fifth season of excellence in biology lectures and uh, for our first speaker for this season is Dr. Costantina Christodoulou who works at Bristol Myers Squibb and she will be talking about hematopoietic stem cells to mature cells and the road from uh, to drug discovery. So allow me before I give the floor to Dr. Christodoulou to get to meet her through a quick look into her CV. And just before that, uh, please know that uh, Dr. Christodoulou is from Cyprus and is one of the many scientists that make Cyprus proud worldwide. So thank you, Costa Dinamo, for being with us today. Uh, so Dr. Christodoulou received her bachelor's in biological sciences from the University of Athens in Greece and then her PhD in genetics and genomics from Boston University School of Medicine at the United States of America. <clears throat> she then acquired postdoctoral training at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard University School of Medicine, during uh, which she pioneered multiple seminal studies involving liver and hematopoietic stem cells. Dr. Christodoulou was then recruited by Novartis Institutes of Biomedical Research to lead a scientific team focusing on the identification and validation of a novel sickle cell anemia gene that could be targeted using small molecules. Further expanding her drug discovery expertise, Dr. Christodoulou is currently a principal scientist lab head at Bristol Myers Squibb in the Oncology Drug Discovery Biology Group. Um, alongside with her team, she leads a drug discovery project for an immuno-oncology target using proprietary chemical matter. Her key areas of interest include hematology, oncology, immuno-oncology, and related drug discovery for new cancer targets. Dr. Christodoulou has authored and published several impactful papers in Nature, Cell, and Journal of Clinical Investigation, among others, while she is the recipient of multiple Industrial Excellence Awards and the prestigious Manton Center of Orphan Diseases Fellowship. So as you see, Cyprus is excelling worldwide. Costantino, thank you for accepting the invitation and the floor is yours. Thank you for having me. It's a great honor um, to be part of this series. And I hope that um, I'll, I'll put in a little bit of seed on how drug discovery is done um, and how we can potentially take advantage of the expertise that we get in from basic research and convert it into a drug that could actually be used in the human setting. Um, so as Maria alluded today, what I'm going to be talking to you about is um, hematopoietic stem cells and how we can uh, actually study them. And um, of course, the usage of that information and how we can convert it into something translational and downstream um, how we can take advantage of all the expertise and experience that we gain from this basic research and apply it in a drug discovery setting. So why stem cells? Uh, stem cells, as many of you may know, they can actually uh, self-renew and they can produce more stem cells. But at the same time, stem cells can actually also differentiate into progenitor cells. And these progenitor cells can further differentiate into the mature uh, cells that are part of the different tissues. And what's important about the stem as well as progenitor cells is that these cells play a crucial role in organ maintenance, not only under homeostatic conditions, but also under injury. So what you can understand from this is that by understanding the behavior of stem cells, you can actually enhance the development of novel therapeutic strategies. 
So um, to, uh, to sort of demonstrate that, my talk will be um, subdivided into two parts. The first part that will focus on naive cells, um, in particular adult hematopoietic stem cells. And I will also be giving you a couple of highlights of progenitor cells, in particular of the liver system, and how we can translate some of that science into translational applicability. Well, the second part of my talk would actually focus on drug discovery. What exactly is drug discovery and um, how we actually approach it in the pharmaceutical setting. So for the first part of my talk, there's many people that need to be thanked and I'm not gonna go through them one by one, but I just wanna give a shout out um, to uh, the people that you've seen the pictures, Joel, Allison, uh, Dean, as well as Masaki, with whom we worked extremely close with and generated some of the data that is going to be shared with you today. So hematopoietic stem cells, um, how can we study them and why do we study them? Uh, my first part of the talk will actually focus on live animal imaging of naive long-term HSCs. And um, the data that you're gonna be seeing is with the use of novel animal models uh, that I had generated at the time uh, at Harvard. Even though I'm not going to go um, in depth, there is a follow-up study that actually has just been published in Nature, um, where we actually not only uh, studied adult cells, but we actually traced the emergence of maintenance of the hematopoietic lineage. And I encourage everybody looking for the paper and seeing what the story is all about and why it's important to also understand from embryological stages to adulthood stages, the different roles that stem cells as well as progenitals can actually play. So what exactly are hematopoietic stem cells? Hematopoietic stem cells are cells that they're at the top of the hierarchy in the hematology tree. They obviously have the capacity to self-renew, but they can also differentiate into multipotent progenitors. These multipotent progenitors can actually downstream give rise into more restricted progenitors that can further differentiate into the many different mature cell types that are part of the blood system. What's important to point out is that the lab that I belong to alongside with my research as well as other people's in the lab um, has really changed the way that we think hematopoiesis as what we showed was that there's different drivers um, depending on the setting that you actually study the system. Under transplant setting, the, these long-term hematopoietic stem cells are the ones that play a key role in the maintenance and regeneration of the system. On, in contrast, and to our surprise, is that under steady state, steady state, multipotent progenitors are the ones that are actually maintaining the great majority of the hematopoietic system. Apart from all of these different types of blood types, the blood system is also found in a very complex uh, microenvironment. And this is called the bone marrow niche. And there's been a lot of work for decades now to really understand the significance of all the different type of populations that are part of this uh, niche and whether those actually play a crucial role in interacting with either the hematopoietic stem cells or the multipotent progenitors. And by interacting with it, they can exchange information that's altering the fate or the consequence that these cells will do under uh, homeostatic as well as under injury setting. At this time, there is many, many challenges that one of us, uh, that all of us have had in understanding what these native hematopoietic stem cells, as well as what the multipotent progenitors can do in their naive environment. And these challenges are because number one, intravital microscopy is actually feasible, but it has only been done um, using transplantation, uh, transplanted cells. 
The second challenge that we are facing is that the current hematopoietic stem cell reported models, even though um, they are great and they have really advanced the field and understanding what the role of these cells is um, in the maintenance of the hematopoietic system, most of them are actually not able to be used under living aging. And the reasoning behind that is because they're not specific enough. They, uh, the, some of them actually label um, both HSCs as well as progenitor cells, others label HSCs as well as microenvironment and niche cells. Therefore, they're, they're just not specific. So in order for us to be able to do such work, there's many requirements and we will need to really develop a new mouse model basically that will not only be long-term hematopoietic stem cell specific, it will not be expressed in the niche cells and importantly will be bright enough in order for us to actually be able to detect it within the bone marrow cavity of live animals. So if we had such a long-term HSC mouse model, we could actually use it to understand the naive behavior that these cells have as well as the dynamic interactions that they have with nearby cells. So to tackle these, we first generated a, a, mouse, a mouse model called MDS-GFP. And this mouse model, as the name um, entails, it's targeting gene, the gene MDS that has been previously um, implicated in myelodysplastic syndrome. And um, what we did was to actually target the first exon using a GFP fluorescence. The first thing that we did was to actually go in using flow cytometry tools to really understand what these cells are and whether they are restricted uh, expression, expression in the HSC compartment or it's also labeling progenitor cells that are downstream. What you can um, really appreciate from this very simplistic snapshot of our flow data is that this GFP fraction um, actually represents a very, very rare population. And even though this population is not expressed in the niche cells, it is um, expressed in almost both all both the HSCs, long-term HSCs, as well as the progenitor stage. So this mouse model, even though uh, useful, it's uh, mainly labeling multipotent progenitors. So can we do anything to actually restrict the expression of this mouse model and make it more specific to the long-term hematopoietic stem cell so that we can actually take leverage of this system to really understand the behavior and the contributions that these real agencies have in the maintenance of hematopoiesis. To do that, what we did was to actually combine these with the FLET3 Cree transgenic mouse model. And FLET3 expression is actually expressed downstream in the hematopoietic hierarchy and uh, starts its expression upon differentiation to multipotent progenitors. Real long-term HSC should not express this gene. So what we hypothesized was that combination with the MDS-GFP reporter will actually restrict the expression of GFP cells exclusively to the long-term HSC fraction. And that's exactly what it did. What you can appreciate from these um, simplistic flow charts is that long-term HSCs um, are mainly um, in this GFP fraction. And what's important to also point out is that this GFP fraction is now actually 10 times even more rare than the original GFP fraction that we labeled using the single knocking mouse model. So what I've shown you so far is that we've got two mouse models, one that express one that is mainly expressed in the multipotent progenitors and one, one that is mainly expressed in the long-term HSC fraction. 
To further um, confirm that this uh, second mouse model was really labeling long-term HSCs, we took it a step further and we did single cell RNA-seq. And um, we did show that these HSCs that are GFP are transcriptionally equal to long-term HSCs. They're restricted to the long-term HSC RNA-seq signature, and they're not expressed in any of the multipotent as well as mature cell fractions. In addition to these, these cells are extremely highly dormant. Um, this means that uh, once you remove the multipotent fraction and you really restrict into the long-term HSC, these cells are extremely quiescent in the naive fraction. And what's even more important is that we've also went ahead and we also did functional studies and we showed that these cells are functional. They can contribute in long-term manner in multi-lineage manner. So here I'm just showing you granulocyte contribution upon five months of transplantation. So there's long-term myeloid contribution, but we've also shown parallel lymphoid contribution coming from these GFP transplanted sets. So we've now confirmed our mouse models and what we can do with them was to originally try to scavenge whether we could use them in real time to do in vivo imaging. So to do so, we actually partner with Charles Lin's lab in uh, Mass General Hospital. And Charles Lin is really one of the handful pioneers in doing live animal in vivo bone marrow imaging of the Calvaria. So that is the skull uh, bone marrow cavity. And alongside with Joel, we sought to actually apply these mouse models in uh, using his um, live animal bone marrow methodology. So the first thing that we tried to do was to determine whether these animal models were compatible with live animal calvaria imaging. And what you're seeing over here is a Z-stack image where the red labels our blood flow as well as vasculature. The GFP labels our long-term HSCs. Um, and what we can see is that we can clearly dis distinguish these GFPs from the autofluorescent cells that are nearby, that are not long-term HSCs, as well as clearly distinguish the location of these uh, GFP cells in correlation to the vasculature. So we imaged both the multipotent uh, model as well as long-term HSC model. And what you can appreciate as also demonstrated from the original flow data that I shared is that in the multipotent setting, we can actually identify many more GFP cells while in the long-term HSC setting, uh, we can only identify very, very few rare single cells um, that we uh, have, uh, that we find throughout the whole skull cavity. So upon uh, showing that we can actually use this technology for live animal imaging, um, then um, we started asking different type of questions that they were controversial um, in the literature. Can we actually understand um, where these multipotent progenitors as well as long-term HSCs are actually localized? This has been a long debate in the hematopoietic field um, with different groups describing different localizations and different environments. What is the oxygen environment that these cells are found and what are their behavioral dynamics? Do they move? Do they change locations or not um, under knife settings? So the first thing was to answer the localization controversy. And of course, this was important as I alluded that there was uh, there's a lot of literature and debate on whether you have an industrial um, niche, a sinusoidal niche or an arterial niche. Um, and of course, there's also very little knowledge um, about multipotent progenitors, the vast majority of, of uh, of uh, publications out there are really focusing on the hematopoietic stem cell compartment. 
So the first thing that we did was to actually uh, measure the localization and the distances that these GFP cells had um, from the nearby cells. So first we looked at the vasculature and what we saw was that both multipotent progenitors as well as long-term HSCs are equally close to the vasculature. But what's different between the two is that long-term HSCs have a sinusoidal niche Whereas multipotent progenitors can actually be found close to transition zones. What's important is that we also uh, try to understand the localization of these cells uh, in correlation to the endosteum. The endosteum is basically the first layer of the bone uh, cavity that is found closer to the bone marrow. And what we saw was that um, in both cases, but to our surprise, long-term HSCs were found in, a, in very, very close proximity um, to uh, the first layer of the bone cavity. So our conclusion from these was that long-term HSCs really have a dual endosteal and vascular niche. So what is this niche um, encompassed from? What is the, the oxygen measurements? Is it really a hypoxic niche? As we've, we've hypothesized for many years that these real HSCs really reside in the deepest hypoxic bone marrow regions. And all the data that we've had for these hypotheses have really been in direct oxygen measurements that really lack spatial uh, resolution. So what we did was to take advantage of the technology that Joel had generated um, a couple of years before where um, he basically used oxygen probes to directly measure the local oxygen concentration within the bone marrow of these live animals. And here is just a snapshot just to show you that um, what um, the different type of measurements uh, we're taking are, um, and each dot is basically one region that we are able to count the oxygen environment upon injections of these different oxygen probes. The first thing that we did was to actually measure the oxygen environment in the vascular as well as extravascular uh, regions to really determine um, the high oxygen uh, concentrations as well as the hypoxic uh, concentrations. And what we then did was to actually use our multipotent as well as long-term HSC models to look at where exactly in, in the oxygen scale these GFP cells were found. And what we observed is that these long-term HSCs, to our surprise, don't really lie within the most deep hypoxic bone marrow pockets. And they're actually found in very, very similar hypoxic regions with multipotent progenitors. This is actually quite important because what we have assumed so far is that the oxygen environment really changes the quiescent properties of these cells. Therefore, the multipotent progenitors that are able to differentiate, they're able to do so because it was hypothesized that they were found in more oxygen-enriched regions in contrast to the long-term HSCs that would be found in very hypoxic regions. Of course, our data suggests that that's not the case, and most likely oxygen is not the most important factor that, that plays a role on whether these cells are quiescent and their HSCs, or they're more active and their progenitor cells. So the, se the next question that we sought after was to really understand the behavioral dynamics that these cells have. Um, as of now, there's very little known on the behavior of the native long-term HSCs, and this was mainly due to the lack of very specific animal models. But now we do have two animal models that we could use. So what we did was to actually do time-lapse imaging. And what you're gonna see over here is a 20 minute time-lapse where you can really appreciate that the GFP cell that um, here is marked uh, is marking long-term HSCs, it's not really moving at least at the, within that 20 minute time period. 
And even though I'm not going to share the data, we are able to actually image these mice for roughly six to seven hours. And we, what we do understand now is that really these long-term HSCs are basically almost completely motel and they don't really change their location uh, throughout time. What's different in, uh, is the multipotent progenitors. And what you will appreciate from this movie is if you focus on where the GFP cell is over here in correlation to the white arrow, what you see is that um, you do see within the 20 minute time lapse that this um, multipotent progenitor actually travels a small distance within that time. And of course, we have imaged for longer period of times, and we do understand that that, uh, that distance that it travels, it can be longer. There are cells that, are actu that may actually escape in the vas vasculature and disappear from our field of view. Um, and of course, that depends on what this, that cell is destined to do um, during this naive setting. So if under the naive settings, the HSCs don't really move and they don't really do much, but multipotent progenitors seem to move and they potentially do things, um, what exactly happens when you activate? Um, so what we did was to take advantage of a classic activation model, um, which takes advantage of cyclophosphamide as well as GCSF. And um, we looked at one, the numbers, of long-term HSCs that we're now able to see upon treatment. And importantly, we also looked um, with time-lapse imaging on what these cells are really doing. Here, this is just a small cartoon of um, one cranium, um, basically just showing how rare these GFP cells are within the bone marrow cavity. This is a man of three in a naive situation. And this is a second cartoon where um, we looked at an, an NF4, and these mice are after um, the activation conditions um, uh, upon injections of these agents. And what you can clearly appreciate is that one, these long-term HSCs robustly expand. We can see way, way more GFP cells. But what's important is that they also seem to be expanding in spatially restricted clusters, suggesting that all of these clusters are actually derived from a single clone that was previously found as a single GFP cell. So of course, the most, uh, the most obvious question that we first wanted to answer was whether these activated long-term HSCs um, are changing behavior. And what you will see in these time lapse is different type of behaviors. Um, what you will see in the blue circle is one cell that really doesn't really move much and that stays within um, within the same spatial uh, space spatial space. Um, what you will see in the yellow circle is one cell that um, upon a six hour time lapse we actually captured moving away through the blood flow outside in a different, um, in a different uh, field of view. And in the purple um, circle, what you will observe is that we did seem to observe a division, so clonal expansion of these GFP cells. And most importantly, we are now seeing that daughter cells are actually demonstrating paired cell movements, and they move together as pairs, as cell clusters. Of course, we also looked at the location of these cells and whether these activated long-term HSCs are actually changing their location. And what we were able to see was that not only they don't change their location, but they're actually found in even closer proximity to sinusoids. And of course, we also looked at the bone marrow cavity, as I previously alluded to you, that we observed a dual endosteal as well as vasculature niche. And what we did here was to actually uh, take advantage of different calcium binding dyes that um, gave us the opportunity to distinguish different type 
of, um, of bone uh, types. The first one was resorption. The second one was a mixed type where there was active bone remodeling occurring in that area. And the last one was the position type. And what you can appreciate from here, uh, from this simplistic figure is that these marrow cavities that they are um, enriched with bone remodeling activity, they correlate very, very closely with these activated long-term HSCs. So what I've shown you so far is that we generated two novel mouse models, uh, one that can track with multipotent progenitors and the other one tracking with long-term HSCs that we can use for the first time to do live animal imaging. And we can now ask different type of questions in terms of their localization, oxygen, oxygen location, as well as behavioral dynamics. A lot of these questions being quite controversial and under debate for decades. So under native hematopoiesis, what I've shown you is that long-term HSCs uh, seem to have this dual endosteal as well as vasculature niche. Um, whereas multipotent progenitors are found um, in different uh, proximities with different type of vessels and different distances uh, from the endosteum. What's important is that upon activation of the hematopoiesis, what we observed was that these single long-term HSCs could now most likely clonally expand and form clusters. And these clusters were very, very tightly correlated with sinusoids, as well as bone cavities that were undergoing active remodeling at the time. This work was published in Nature, um, and anybody that would like further information um, can go and read the rest of the paper and the interesting findings that we showed. So of course, all of this is great, but all of this is in the mouse system, and um, we don't know whether this can actually be translated in the human setting and whether we can actually take advantage of any of the information that um, we find um, in and apply it. So there's different ways to do that. And here, um, I'm gonna demonstrate a couple of ways that we try to take advantage of these mouse findings and convert them into something that it's gonna be more translational uh, related. So the first thing that we did was to take advantage of our MDSGFP cells and actually do in vitro screening for the discovery of compounds that could play a role in long-term HSC proliferation in vitro. And what we did was to actually screen through 4,500 small molecules in in-house libraries. And this is just different examples of what we were expecting. If we had compounds that were toxic, we wouldn't see a lot of cells and we would see reduction of the of the overall population. If the compound would drive differentiation, we would actually see um, reduction of the GFP. If it wasn't really doing anything, we would just see maintenance of the GFP levels. But importantly, if we were able to identify a compound that was playing a role in expansion, we would actually um, observe that this GFP would actually take over and it will be uh, demonstrated as expansion of this GFP population. So upon uh, conducting these screens, we were able to identify a couple of heats um, and these heats uh, were actually taken to secondary heats. And this is something that Fernando's lab um, is currently working on. In another way that we can translate these findings is to actually use uh, some of these two, uh, some of these mouse models um, to actually understand the differentiation signals that play a role in the differentiation of hematopoietic stem cells into progenitor cells. So to do that, we actually generated embryonic stem cells um, that had our MDS-GFP marker, and we also incorporated the CD45, CD tomato marker. And um, what this embryonic stem cell line 
can do is that we can actually look on the in vitro system and we can differentiate to HSCs. So we can really understand the signaling pathways for HSC specification. We can actually also identify different culture conditions for the maintenance of long-term HSCs immunophenotype in culture. And this is quite important as this is something that we're really struggling at the moment. And of course, we can also perform more basic research um, using single cell RNA-seq to really understand whether there's different subsets of hematopoietic stem cells. And if there, if there are different subsets, whether these subsets are really functionally doing something different. In addition to this, um, we can also uh, incorporate these mouse models with niche models. And why is this important? This is important because currently uh, a lot of the industry is really focusing on whether we can potentially target niche cells um, as a treatment for some of these uh, diseases that uh, patients have. So here, what we did was to actually combine our MDS GFP reporter with the CXCL10, um, CXCL12 reporter. And what we, you can see over here marked by um, the two different arrows is that long-term HSCs can really be found in very close proximity uh, with these niche cells. And as mentioned, we can do that with using many different um, reporters, and we can now dissect out whether we can really target some of these niche populations to actually alter the behavior um, or the functionality of these HSCs that are found in close proximity. Finally, one thing that we can do is really determine how these long-term HSCs really behave during disease. So to do that, we could potentially cross these long-term HSC models with a FLET3 ITD leukemia model, um, and we can do some of these live animal imaging to really not only identify the role of long-term HSCs, but also the role of niche cells in the progression of disease, and in this particular case, leukemia. And the last thing that we can do that it's very, very important is to really identify the different niche cells that can play a role in uh, the transition of a hematopoietic stem cell into a cancer stem cell. And can we target these niche cells again to prevent the disease from occurring or to even correct it? So, so far, what I've shown you is mainly mouse to mouse, mouse basic research and how it can be translated into a mouse translational research. What I just want to share in the next couple of slides very quickly is how we can potentially take advantage of knowledge that we can gain from the mouse system and directly apply it in the human system. And even though I'm not going to go into detail on these, the, as this work uh, was published in Cell, what we did over here alongside with Dean was to um, demonstrate the YAP, that YAP plays a very, very important role um, in the conversion and um, the differentiation of mature hepatocytes into progenitor liver stem cell-like um, cells. What we did alongside with the mechanism in this study, um, I actually had generated a liver organoid cell culture that was novel at the time. And alongside with the liver organoids uh, culture, I also generated differentiation, um, differentiation in vitro models where we could now differentiate uh, progenitor cells into mature cells, and we could potentially um, put them back into disease liver um, models, mouse models, and ask the question whether these cells are now correcting the disease. Of course, this was in the mouse setting. So what we did alongside with Masaki was to see whether we could actually translate some of these mouse findings into the human setting. So to do that, we actually uh, took liver biopsies from patients that were, uh, that were um, suffering from citrullinemia type one. And this is a metabolic disease of the liver. 
And what we did was to actually use the liver culture system that was developed in the mouse system. And we used it to actually uh, generate as well as culture human disease the liver stem cells. We then use these stem cells uh, to actually identify the mutation that was correlated with the disease. And we corrected the disease using specific CRISPR guides. We then use the differentiation models um, to directly differentiate these progenitor cells into mature cells. And um, upon uh, differentiation, we then put them back into the liver of a diseased mouse model. And uh, we demonstrated that it could now regenerate um, uh, the liver and it could actually reconstitute um, and enable um, enable reduction of the disease. So of course, what you can understand from this is that this is really something that it could potentially also be applied in the human setting, not just in the human in vitro setting. And this could potentially be considered as an autologous patient specific reconstitu reconstituting therapy. So this brings me to the second part of my talk that is going to uh, focus on drug discovery and what exactly drug discovery process is. Um, as you all know, uh, I am part of uh, Bristol Myers Squibb, which is a pharmaceutical company. Um, and um, even though we, we do a lot of this basic research in academia, what we struggle with uh, is really the conversion of some of this basic research into a chemical matter that could actually be used um, as drug to target specific diseases. So what exactly is drug discovery process? The drug discovery process is a very, very lengthy process. It can take up to 13 years to actually take a, a drug from uh, beginning to the market. Um, and it's actually staged in four main stages. The first stage is early drug discovery and development. And this is in, in the, a very similar um, case as the type of research that we do in academia, where um, we do basic science and we try to understand the role of genes and the mechanisms that they have in a disease. What's important is that upon completion of this stage, you can then move to preclinical research. Um, and what is exactly preclinical research? Preclinical research is when you have a compound that is now a drug candidate, and this drug candidate can actually uh, be used in the animal setting to uh, show not only improvement of a disease, but also um, not toxicity. And this drug candidate can then be moved into a clinical research, with, which is basically the different type of clinical trials that you have in humans. And finally, um, followed by uh, approval as well as marketing of the drug. So the early drug discovery and development stage um, is actually um, composed of many different phases. The first phase is composed from target identification and target validation. Um, and here we do basic research where we try to find different genes that we could potentially target and we can understand their expression profile. We can understand their mechanism of action in a disease setting. Um, and we also look at them in an in vivo setting where we try to understand their impact um, in usually mouse models. At the end of the target validation stage, we actually um, do perform high throughput screenings if the target has been truly validated. And the high throughput screenings aim to find chemical matter that could potentially be used to target um, these genes. These two, these two phases are actually followed by lead identification as well as lead optimization. And in these um, two later phases of early drug discovery, what we do is uh, really we have 
elite series, chemical series that we have identified. We generate many different type of assays, biochemical as well as cellular assays, both in the mouse as well as the human setting. And we try to screen a lot of these assays as well as understand what each of these compounds is doing and how it's bounding on its target. And uh, as well as understand the pharmacokinetics as well as pharmacodynamics uh, relationships in the in vivo setting. At the end of this lead optimization phase, um, you have a drug candidate. And that drug candidate is usually one or two chemical molecules that are taken to the preclinical research phase. The preclinical pre research phase is actually composed of two different stages. The first one is um, developing different type of human assays, as well as understanding the different DMPK properties of these drug candidates, as well as the toxicology and the effects, the toxicology effects that these drugs would have um, in different species, usually mouse, rat, as well as dog. And um, if the data look good, then you can consider uh, to um, apply for an investigational drug candidate to FDA. And what this um, application involves is really showing and demonstrating all of the different type of data that you got from your early direct discovery as well as your preclinical research and um, arguing uh, how it would benefit a very specific subset of disease population. The pre, upon approval of the IND, you then enter clinical, clinical research, and clinical research, as I mentioned, is basically the different type of clinical, uh, clinical trials. There's phase one, phase two, and phase three, as you may know, and each of them have a slightly different goal. Um, and of course, each of them have a different number of human individuals that um, participate in the study. In the first phase, you typically have up to 10 healthy volunteer, volunteers, and your goal is to really understand the safety as well as the dosage um, that you need to give um, downstream to patients. When you move to phase two, and only 70% of the drugs that enter clinical phase one actually move to phase two, um, then you start recruiting uh, your disease patients, and um, you look at up to 500 individuals, and your goal is to really understand not only the efficacy of your drug, but also the different type of side effects that you may have. And if everything looks great in your um, Phase two, then you move into phase three, only 33% of the drugs actually move to the next phase. And this phase three um, actually involves many, many thousands of patients. Um, and here you uh, monitor further, not only efficacy, but also the different, the different adverse events that you may observe um, in a long-term setting. Uh, and what's important to really point out is that only 25% of the drugs that enter phase three will actually move forward into a new drug application that could be considered from the drug authorities um, for approval and downstream marketing. And of course, if your drug is successful to, to make the mark and be approved, um, upon, upon marketing, um, the authorities do monitor side effects as well as adverse, ev adverse events for many, many years in many, many thousands of patients that receive this drug. So having said this, I just want to give you a couple of examples of the type of work that my labs have worked on, even though I'm not going to be able to describe any of the targets or show any specific data due to confidentiality reasons. Um, I just want to share a couple of a couple of snapshots of what we do. Um, this is one of the projects that I worked during my time at Novartis, uh, where we tackled sickle cell anemia. And as you may know, sickle cell anemia is a very severe blood 
um, anemia disorder um, that is caused by a single point mutation where you have a conversion of glutamine into valamine. And this results into the hemoglobin alpha conversion into a hemoglobin S. Hemoglobin S has different oxygen binding properties. And because of these different oxygen binding properties, um, it can actually form these polymerized chains that really results in the cellular phenotypic changes that you observe in red blood cells and converts them from a round cell into a half moon-like sickle cell. And these half moon sickle cells are the ones that are responsible for the vessel occlusion crisis that these patients suffer from, which is one of the main um, symptoms that these patients have. And there's many ways that you can tackle this disease. And there's a few things that are already out in the market. Um, and the first one is to really target the symptoms of vessel occlusion crisis. The second one is to try to modulate hemoglobin um, properties and oxygenation by um, doing by looking at hemoglobin modifiers as well as ATP modulators, as well as fetal hemoglobin modulators that they have different affinity um, to oxygen. So the project that uh, we tackled over here, we actually started from a target ID, from the target ID phase. It was just a hypothesis. There wasn't a lot of literature on the gene. Um, so what we did was to actually um, not only identify the gene, but also validate it by in the mouse as well as human setting uh, by using different type of cellular assays that we developed. We also generated in vivo knockout models that we then crossed with published sickle cell disease models um, and showed that there was improvement of the disease. Um, and of course, um, this target, because it was so nicely validated, um, we were able to actually initiate some of these chemical compound screens, and uh, we were able to identify a few lead uh, uh, ser chemical series that, so we worked hand in hand with all the chemistry teams uh, to perform this, as well as all the biophysics colleagues to really understand the crystallography properties of our compounds, as well as the binding properties to our targets. Now at Bristol Myers Squibb, um, where my team is actually trying to approach um, a different uh, type of setting. And um, this team um, is focused on immunotherapy resistance, uh, which is one of the main issues that we currently have in different type of uh, patients that are being uh, treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors and the resulting resistance that these patients acquire. So what we're trying to tackle is whether we can actually find novel targets that can surpass this immunotherapy resistance that is observed in a great majority of patients and actually take them, uh, use this new target as a potential drug um, for uh, disease curement. This project is actually in a much later stage. We're currently in lead optimization. We not only have a chemical series, but we're currently um, triaging different type of compounds that um, we are trying to rank and uh, nail down which one is the most efficient and which one would be our drug candidate that we will then move to preclinical research and IMD. Um, and of course, as you understand, this is a much later stage project. So we work very, very closely with in vivo pharmacology, um, with the in vivo pharmacology team to really establish the different pharmacokinetics as well as pharmacodynamic and efficacy relationships that we get from all of these different compounds. We also try to understand our mechanism of action, not only in the in vitro level, but also now in the in vivo level and what it does in a tumor uh, xenograft setting. Uh, we work very, very closely with toxicology teams on designing preliminary talk studies that will really um, enable our understanding of chronic as well as acute drug exposure side effects um, in the mouse setting. 
Um, of course, we work very, very closely with leads discovery and optimization. And this team uh, is a team that basically takes over some of the cellular assays that we develop and miniaturizes them so that they can be used uh, to screen uh, the thousands of compounds that um, we produce and we try to test. And finally, uh, we work closely with translational research so that we can really enable the generation of a human whole blood assay that we could potentially consider uh, to use um, if we go to clinical uh, setting um, and acquire clinical samples. So with that being said, um, I want to thank everybody that attended the seminar and um, I'd be happy to take any questions that came through the chat. Thank you, Costadina. Well, that was a really interesting and very eye-opening, I guess I would say, presentation. It's, uh, it's really miraculous. I mean, the level of detail that you can get by imaging at this stage, like seeing the cells move and the different populations, that's amazing. Um, so um, uh, until we get some other questions, let's start with the first one from Mrs. Alexia Iliadis, who, who I guess had to leave a bit early. <laughs> Uh, so excellent work from an excellent scientist. I couldn't agree more. Keep up with the innovative and groundbreaking work. My question is whether these LTHSCs and MPPs have different embryonic origins. Do they originate from the same embryonic uh, 10.5 AGM embryonic cell, cell population? So yeah, was, uh, mm -hmm. I think that's a fantastic question. And that's actually a question that we tackle in the second nature paper that was actually just published a couple of months ago. Um, I'll give you a snapshot of the of the findings. Yes, these cells do arise from the same cell. So the archaic stem cell is the same. Um, but what's interesting is that um, the hematopoietic stem cells are actually established very, very early on in embryogenesis. And that's also the case for these multipotent progenitors. And what we observed is that under naive situation, when you don't have injury and everything is going blessfully, um, these multipotent progenitors are actually the ones that are making the majority of your hematopoietic system. And that actually starts from the embryogenic stages and not from the adulthood. So um, these, you can think of these HSCs as sort of like the reserve for injury. They take over when something happens and they are there to really tackle the very, very serious issues that can occur with aging as well as, um, as, well as different type of diseases that can occur. And what you can think of multipotent progenitors is basically this population that basically really maintains your uh, hematopoietic system and blood system when there's nothing going wrong. So you've got the, your reserve pool that is really staying quiescent. It doesn't do much until it's really, really needed. And then you have your other population that has all the differentiation as well as proliferation capacity that now can take over basically during the normal conditions and during naive and maintain as well as generate a lot of the system. So one question that just popped out in, in my mind, maybe you mentioned it, so I apologize if it's naive. So for the quiescent population, are they quiescent from the beginning of embryonic life until yes. whatever they needed? Don't they accumulate yeah. any mutations or any sort of? Yes, I think that's a problem. that's a very very a very important question. Of course, there's going to be mutation acquirement in particular with aging. We do understand that hematopoietic stem cells, in particular, they do change with aging, and a lot of them are not perfect stem cells anymore because of this mutational burden. Um, but in the great majority, in during embryogenesis, they keep proliferating so that they can generate basically the that is needed. 
And then uh, apart from that, they just stay quiescent in reality and they, uh, they take over when you have um, a problem. Of course, the mutational burden is very, very, is a very important um, uh, parameter that we have to take in mind uh, when we do all of these studies. And for that reason, in many of the cases, at least in the mouse models that we use, we use young mice and not aged mice. Um, but it would be interesting to actually look at aged mice and see how um, the properties of some of these stem cells actually change. Um, and I bet you what we will see is that these cells are actually converted from quiescent into more active with time and mutational acquirement. I see, that's very interesting. Um, and since we don't have another question, I'll just take advantage of that. So um, I was very impressed again from the imaging, but uh, so what I, what I was looking at is like the long-term HSCs versus the MPPs, do they have different localization depending on the, the vasculature type or density? Was it my impression or is it just that So specific? it's not vasculature density, but rather vasculature type. Um, okay. So multipotent progenitors are actually also found close to transition zones. Transition zones are um, little vessels, basically, that they uh, unite sinusoids with arterioles. Okay. So different oxygen environments, as well as different niche cells that are found closer to that, uh, to that area. Um, and they're also found, um, we, we were able to also see some of these multipotent progenitors in uh, regions that are arterial uh, regions, at least morphologically wise. Okay. Um, so it's not a matter of density, but rather type. Type. And with that regard, so... Since the imaging that you showed, the results were taken from uh, the skull, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the head. Um, will the type of the cells differ if it was in a different area, like yeah. say for the arm or the... the yeah, uh, great question. And one actually that we were challenged a lot um, with okay. the, by the reviewers when we, <laughs> uh, when we first um, submitted the paper. Um, so the answer to that is no, the findings are more or less the same. What's different okay. is the, um, between different cavities is really the, um, uh, the depth of each of the cavity, right? Um, so a skull cavity is much more shallow. It only contains 10% of the marrow, whereas a femur cavity is far more deep. Um, and of course, the more deep you move, of course, there's gonna be cells that are gonna be found that they're not close to the endosteum and the bone regions, but they're only surrounded by vasculature environment, correct? Mm -hmm. So um, more or less the findings are, are the same. We did look at different types of femurs um, and we do show that uh, long-term HSCs also there are found closer, close to both. Uh, endosteal as well as vasculature. Of course, we can also observe cells that are deeper in the cavity as expected, um, that they are only surrounded by vasculature regions. But the um, uh, commonality of this is that they're always exclusively found close to sinusoids and not to any other vasculature uh, type um, per se. Um, when you look close to the bone, you do still identify a dual niche. Um, what's going to be interesting is to actually determine if there is difference in the functionality of cells that are found deeper in the cavity versus cells that are found closer to the bone region. Mm. Are the cells that are found closer to the bone region potentially playing a role you know, in this bone remodeling uh, mm. process that we observe? Um, and maybe there are a different set of uh, different subset of hematopoietic stem cells in comparison to the ones that are found yeah, deeper. Exactly. Um, and I think the only way to do that is um, if you had a way to 
basically insert a needle in a life yeah. setting and, and capture that one cell in from each of these regions and run single cell RNA seq. And yeah. this does sound a little bit of science fiction, but I think we're actually closer in 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 actually doing so. Charles Lab is really a pioneer in a lot of these uh, technologies, and this is something that they worked very hard on materializing because I think it's a, it's quite an important uh, question. And yeah, I think definitely. now they probably have uh, a way of extrapolating um, cells from the marrow cavity. So we're expecting more cool results in terms of imaging. So, and something that greatly interests me, um, it's uh, again with the relation to the to the head, the brain. Do we know what happens to the what's the behavior of, of these cells when we have brain cancer? Because we know that there's a lot of hematopoiesis, mm -hmm. angiogenesis rather. Uh, right. When you have, especially in glioblastoma, which is one of the deadliest and still not curable cancers. So do, right. are we expecting any new data along those? Uh, yeah, those we don't know. And I think it's a, it's sort of a great question and a gr one great example of how you can translate some of this data into research that is more disease related. Yeah. Um, we don't know. Uh, what's what will what's interesting is that neuronal cells are also part of yeah. um this the hsc niche right yes, there's yes. a lot of nerves that go through all of the bone marrow cavities um so really understanding the relationships and the interactions that those cells have the type of signals that are being exchanged and how that affects uh the patterns that hematopoietic stem cells have could also give us insights on what happens in a disease setting where mm -hmm. you now now have this extreme vasculature uh, happening, and you also may potentially have some of these, you know, hematopoietic stem cells that um, they may no longer be hematopoietic stem cells; they may be something else, yeah, um, exactly. right? Um, but I, I think it's it's a question that we don't have an answer for, but a great example of how we can actually translate uh, some of yeah. these basic research mouse findings into something that is more human disease related. Yeah, this is a, uh, it's a very challenging field and not uh, taking uh, that you mentioned that, uh, that the stem cells, the neural stem cells and the, the established neurons are part of the niche. There's a rising field now called uh, cancer neuroscience, which looks at the systematic uh, uh, view of cancers. So I think uh, we'll be seeing more players identified their interactions in the next years and 100 percent, i'm sure we'll see a lot from your group also hopefully uh, when we're ready to publish and um hopefully uh pass through the ind phase we'll be able to share a little bit more on the work that we've done i'm sure you'll do great because you're cypriot right <laughs> <laughs> So we don't have any other questions uh, thus far. And so uh, unless you have anything else that you would like to add, uh, we can leave you enjoy the rest of your day. It's a holiday there today, right? It is a holiday. Thank you very yeah. much um, for giving me the podium to present some of the work uh, that we do and that I've done uh, throughout the years. Uh, it's been a pleasure and I, I hope the, the work will actually give more motivation to young scientists to really get involved in research and not be scared to answer very difficult, controversial questions. Um, that's the beauty of science. So I hope to see more and more great work coming out from Greek as well as Cypriot scientists that are, are out there. And um, you know, feel free to contact me if there's any other questions that haven't been answered through this. Thank you, Gostandinamo, again. It was uh, great having you. And uh, we look forward to hearing more uh, research news from you in the future. Have a nice rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much, Maria. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you, the invitation. Bye-bye. It was a pleasure. Bye-bye, everybody. Have a good night and good day.